All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Today we are joined by Scott Babb. Scott Babb of Libre Fighting System. Uh, Scott is a lifetime martial artist and the founder of Libre Fighting. Libre Fighting is the most widely recognized knife-based combat system in the world today. He is considered one of the world's leading and most innovative voices on the subjects of knife combat and combatives. Scott has worked with members of various security institutions, military units, special forces, law enforcement agencies, both in the United States and in Mexico. His system is trained by military and special forces security teams all over the world. Scott's work uh, work has been featured on Vice.com, CNN Indonesia, Recoil Concealment, Blade Magazine, Tactical Knives Magazine, and various other uh, publications. Additionally, he is the author of Finding Libre, and you guys may or may not know Libre is Spanish for freedom, so I thought that was actually a a cool title. Um, Libre Fighting, My Life in the Martial Arts and Tao of the Reaper. He also produces the weekly series 60 Second Lessons and is the editor and guiding force behind Sith Magazine. I hope I said that. Sith Sai. Yeah, Sai. Sai Magazine. Um, He's also available for seminars and private lessons uh, in the San Diego area and kind of around as well. I know, Scott, you said right now you're not doing a whole lot of seminars, but eventually you will be getting back, back into that. Yeah, just as soon as things calm down just a little bit more with the pandemic and stuff and there's a little bit less liability, I'll be jumping back into that. Yeah, and I think that's a smart idea, man. Um, before we go any further, I just want to say officially welcome onto the podcast. Thanks for joining us today, man. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Uh, one of the cool things about doing these podcasts and doing a long form with guys like you is actually sitting down and having like an hour or so to talk about, hey, who is the man behind this system? Um, guys. I've been following Libre Fighting on Instagram for a long time now. You also have other social media platforms. I believe you're on YouTube as well. Um, and it's really cool to watch what you're doing. Uh, I'm of the personal opinion that, hey, look, I travel around the world quite a bit. Um, and I can't bring a Glock with me. I can't, you know, I don't have any, um, you know, sustainment kit or anything like that as far as you know shoot them up rambo stuff but what do you always have available is a folder or some kind of edge weapon or even just a pen right so what you guys are doing is really really cool um before we jump into all of that you know methods and tactics and stuff like that i do want to ask you man um to tell us about your background how you got started in the martial arts and kind of where scott babb got his start in the martial arts world uh, so I started very young. I started at eight years old. Uh, I was the smallest kid in a bad neighborhood and I couldn't run very fast. So that meant I had to learn to fight or get my ass kicked. Um, I wasn't a big fan of getting my ass kicked. So I started to look at martial arts. There was a lot of, um, this was the eighties. So ninja movies were big at the time. Kung Fu theater was showing on television, which show the old seventies Kung Fu movies every, uh, every Sunday. Uh, shortly after I started the Karate Kid movies hit, which were obviously huge. Um, and I'm glad to see Cobra Kai's back because that series is fucking phenomenal. Uh, but, uh, you know, and there was a certain reverence that the kids in my neighborhood had for martial arts. And the idea that the little guy uh, would always be kicking the shit out of the big guy and doing these crazy kicks and shit like that. Being a little guy, that really appealed to me. And obviously, since then, I've had a growth spurt. I'm a bigger guy now. But the time I, I really wanted that, you know, magic piece of the puzzle that you saw in martial arts where, you know, the Bruce Lee's of the world and, you know, these guys who had like these near mythical abilities to, to stomp the shit out of the tormentors. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I realized the martial arts had their limitations in that capacity, but that was really what fueled me to get involved was the idea that I just had to learn to fight in the environment I was in. And, in my young and naive mind, I sort of felt like the martial arts uh, was the answer to all my problems. Um, and so I got involved in traditional martial arts. I started training at a community center in Tong, Tong Sudo. Uh, back then, it was much, much different than it is today. Uh, uh, going back to the Karate Kid movies, if you look at the scenes in the original Karate Kid that take place in the Cobra Kai dojo, 
that's fairly close to what it was really like back then. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously exaggerated for dramatic effect, but that militaristic approach to training where you're lining up in formation, answering in unison, uniforms had to be sharp and crisp and clean, um, you know, drilling in unison, all that uh, stuff really was a part of the culture. And, you know, also just taking a beating and giving beatings a lot was part of the culture as well. And that's something that's been lost in the traditional martial arts now. But that was sort of the, the environment I came up with, uh, uh, where we would, uh, you know, it would just finish raining and the park would be all muddy and we'd go running through the park and then punch trees until our knuckles bled. And being corporal punishment, like everything was knuckle push-ups. You know, it didn't move fast enough, forgot to key eye, uh, turned too slow, uh, just the instructor was having a bad day, whatever it was. You know, you're always doing push-ups. You know, as a small child, as eight or nine years old, uh, and then when we got a little bit older, you know, instructor, if you were fucking around in class, might kick you a little bit harder than he uh, meant to uh, and drop you. And so you would kind of get the point like, oh, I'm going to get my ass kicked if I don't stop fucking around. Um, obviously, except for a few rare exceptions, all of that's been lost in like the the uh, shopping center karate uh, situation as you see now. Uh, and so that was my first martial art at uh 15 years old, I first was introduced to Filipino martial arts. Uh, I first learned about it in 1992. I started training it in 1993. And that was just before the, the Filipino martial arts started to go mainstream. So I was kind of at the forefront of uh, the boom of Filipino martial arts. Uh, and uh, that was really what became my passion, the stick fighting. I wasn't so much into knives back then, which is what I do now. You know, I was more of a stick guy. Um, I did some boxing, some Kung Fu, um, but like most martial artists, I cross trained in a lot of things. Uh, boxing was a huge influence on me. Mm. Um, I didn't really start to appreciate the, uh, Western approach to martial arts until I was, uh, in my late teens. I started, uh, doing fencing in college. I started, uh, training in boxing and I really started to, um, see that the Western approach to combat had a lot of merit that as a young man i sort of just disregarded because i was fascinated by the eastern martial arts um i started teaching at 15 years old um as an assistant instructor and i was an assistant instructor for 12 years before i started teaching on my own uh which is something that i think a lot of martial arts instructors uh neglect and really should do they really should apprentice under an accomplished instructor who knows what they're doing for several years before they branch out on their own. I think a lot of people just cross train a bunch of things, develop a certain skill set, and they think that because they can do it, they know how to teach a class or lead a class. And uh, that's not the case. It, it, it takes a lot of experience and a guiding hand to sort of teach you to navigate the, uh, the waters of teaching a class, especially larger classes or more diverse classes. Um, so as assistant instructor for 12 years, that teacher retired and uh, through a series of events, I ended up inheriting some of his students and starting my own class. And uh, those guys really, uh, you know, we it started off as an empty hand class. Then we started building in some of the weapons work and they were really enamored with the blade work, the knife stuff. And I had a problem in that I was never really satisfied with my knife skills. Um, I just didn't think that they were well suited for the Western world, uh, which in retrospect makes a lot of sense because these were developed in a tropical environment where people carry heavy agricultural blades. And it's that environment and those type of blades that the, um, that the martial arts that I studied were, uh, had come from. So the endemics of uh, the culture where these arts emanated from, the tactics made total sense. But in the Western world where we don't carry heavy blades, we carry small pocket knives. And in most of the world, we, most of the Western world, they're more diverse weather where sometimes we're wearing long sleeves and that defang of a snake motion that with a large agricultural knife would take someone's hand off with a pocket knife and someone wearing a leather jacket, you're just going to ruin their jacket and maybe they'll need a few stitches. Um, so I was really, um, really found myself not feeling right about teaching blade work that I didn't have a lot of confidence in to my students. And finally, one day I told my guys, you know, if you really want to focus on knife work, that's really what you guys want to explore. We'll dive into it, but we're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. You know, we're pressure test everything from the ground up. We're going to find out what works and what doesn't, and we're going to start developing it. 
Um, and that's what we did. You know, we just washed the slate clean and we started figuring out what works, what doesn't. Uh, we would pressure test everything in what we call blender sessions, which would be sparring in a confined space. Um, and if we couldn't pull off a tactic in that environment and pull it off instinctively, not hunting to apply that tactic, we omitted it from the system. Uh, from there, uh, I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of the questions. You want me to stop there? Or you want me no, to no, no. On? You keep going, man, because uh, I'm honestly, I got this uh, list of questions, but you're, you're literally answering them one by one. So it's, it's perfect. Um, so from there, uh, I was very fortunate to start working with uh, Ed Calderon of Ed's Manifesto. Wow. Uh, he was the uh, icon that he's become today. Um, and it was interesting uh, because Ed and I had talked for close to a year before we ever met in person. Uh, he had actually reached out to a lot of knife instructors to come down to Mexico and work with the guys back when he was still active. And all the prominent knife instructors he reached out to in the U.S. were scared to go to Mexico. Libre wasn't big then. It hadn't really blown up. But um, he, uh, he reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to go down there. And I grew up in San Diego. So Tijuana is my backyard. If you grow up in San Diego from the time you're 18 to 21, uh, you spend a lot of time in TJ because the drinking age is 18 down there. So everyone goes through a phase if you grow up in San Diego. Maybe not nowadays, but when I grew up. You go through a phase where you spend a lot of time in Tijuana. So I was very comfortable going down to Tijuana. And so we talked for a long time and it just never quite lined up. And then one day he showed up at a seminar. And I remember I'd never seen what he looked like before. Um, I had honestly pictured Danny Tre Trejo. Like I pictured this old grizzled dude tatted up, you know, sort of a weathered, craggy face. And um, no, he showed up. He was like 25, 26 years old. And I was like, dude, you're younger than me, man. And he's like, no, my job, I'm a senior citizen. He's like, by the time you hit 30, you're either dead or working for the cartels or behind a desk. And so um, during the seminar, it was, it was actually a very small seminar. He asked about working against body armor. And I was like, oh man, I love questions like that. And so we just started riffing off that. And then afterwards he's like, all right, dude, I want to train with you. I want you to train my guys. So Ed and I started working together and he started spreading Libre in Mexico. But um uh, we also had the chance to start working with the teams down in Mexico, uh, law enforcement and the guys who go up against the uh, drug cartels. And uh, those guys are just as crazy as you would expect someone in that line of work to be. And they would um, almost find excuses to go out and use what we were teaching them out in the field. And so um, after every incident, we would debrief them and talk to them and find out what happened. You know, what was the bleed out time? What were the circumstances? What worked? What didn't work the way we expected? And we were able to sort of start molding and shaping the system from there. Wow. Uh, and at the same time, Libre was starting to grow. And so people were flying into San Diego from all over the world to train. So we were getting a lot of voices bringing their input into the system here in San Diego. Then we could take it across the border to Tijuana and teach it to these guys who had, you know, a very um, real reason to be using it out in the field and um, getting their feedback. So it was very um, much a geographical uh, blessing that allowed Libre to grow the way that it did. And then from there, we took it to Europe, Southeast Asia, and, you know, people, they started working with different people out there. They, those people would have incidents and give us feedback. And so we were really able to shape the system from there. Uh, just one example of uh, the way that influenced the, that input influenced Libre. Um, the eye attacks that you see us do a lot. And if you follow my work, you see that we're big on attacking the face and the eyes. That was always a part of the system, but it wasn't a big part of the system. And now it is. And in fact, it's the first thing that I teach new students. Hmm. The reason why is we learn through real world feedback that that was what produces an immediate reaction in the opponent. Um, you know, most of the time and every seminar I've taught, almost every seminar, I open by asking if anyone there has ever been shot or not shot, stabbed in the field. Uh, and there's usually one or two. And then I ask if they realize that during the altercation, the answer is almost always no. And when they did, it's not because they felt pain. It was because they either saw the knife or saw blood. Um, so we realize the knife doesn't really have that immediate stopping power. People assume that it does. Um, but what does stop someone in the track their tracks is when you stab them in the eye or slash the eye or actually anywhere just near the eye it'll produce an immediate reaction that puts the opponent on the defensive then you can pressure attack from there and when we learned that from the feedback we were getting i immediately started restructuring the system to start teaching that initially 
uh, one of the things that I, I've gotten a lot of shit about over the years online is people saying uh, we teach overkill or, you know, saying I should teach exclusively non-lethal knife tactics, which I have opinions on. Maybe we'll get into that later. <laughs> but um, I, I do like to, you know, point out that we do teach less lethal knife tactics. You know, the face attacks in and of themselves usually aren't going to produce lethal results, but it will incapacitate someone. It's just a very graphic sort of unsettling stomach churning way of going about non-lethal knife work. It's, it's not as um, palatable maybe as slashing an arm or, or slashing a limb and hoping that incapacitates the opponent. It's a very disturbing mental image to have, but it's also what we found is the most functional. Hmm. That's uh, it's, Wow, it's really interesting what you're saying here as far as the pressure testing, debriefing people after real life situations. And I think, I mean, honestly, this is one of the systems, few systems out there I've ever come across that you guys are actually going to people and saying, all right, well, you use this in Mexico or Guatemala or whatever it was. And this works, this doesn't work. Um, it reminds me a lot of the World War II combatives where you actually had the opportunity to de debrief guys who have been there and done it as opposed to kind of this theoretical stuff with some of the other systems out there. How important do you think sparring and pressure testing is to forge a warrior? Um, I think sparring is important, but I think people miscategorize it because um, sparring is not fighting, especially, um, well, just because we're talking about knife work, to put it in context of, of knives, if you're dueling when you spar if you're squared off on the outside sort of taking cuts like measuring trying to find your way in um that you're going to work range timing um reflexes accuracy you're going to develop those but to think that's going to simulate a real life night bladed altercation it's not um there are still places in the world where people will square off and duel with blades but in the Western world, most of the, uh, most of the world, a knife attack is going to be um, much more violent. It's going to happen closer in, for instance, in the Western world, most knife attacks, the attacker isn't going to show the blade ahead of time if they with it. They're going to keep it concealed. They're going to get in close, uh, probably in some kind of confined space, and then go to town on you with a prison stabbing uh, style attack, whether they latch onto your shirt, your head, whatever the case may be, and start prison stabbing you. Um, so I think it's important to understand that, um, sparring alone is going to prepare you for dealing with a knife attack. That's why I like to have my guys do the blender sessions to put them in a confined space where they can't have the luxury of distance. And if they try to be passive about it, um, the opponent is just going to overwhelm them and they have to be aware of the walls around them, use the walls. Um, and obviously you're going to get banged up in a session like that. And we tend to only do about 20 seconds in it per blender session. Uh, and even then you're going to end up, you know, a little busted up and broken up uh, because of uh, just, just, it's such a rough scenario. But I think that level of violent or that level of training uh, prepares you better for um, the kind of violent uh, encounters you're going to run into in the world. And then more recently, and this is something, if you follow us on Instagram, you've seen me gravitating more towards uh this comes from uh, having the opportunity of done, to have worked with uh, Lee Morrison of Urban Combatives and mm -hmm. seeing the scenario-based training that he does. Uh, and I think that's an important piece of the puzzle as well. And what I like to do is um, I actually look at real-life assaults, whether the perpetrator had a bat or a knife or whatever it might be, and recreate that scenario in my class. You know, the type of environment, was it low light? Was it uh, a lit situation? Was it confined space out in the open? what range did the attack start from, what pre-threat cues were and play there. Analyze something that's actually happened in the real world that we can see on CCTV and recreate that scenario and then put my guys into it and make them fight their way out of it. Um, and so to me, that's kind of, um, you kind of need all of it. You need to have the sparring sessions on the outside where they can sort of measure their tactics and get at it. But you also need those confined space sparring sessions where it's just going to be violent and too fast and chaotic to analyze anything and where you're getting sort of manhandled and throwing people around and getting jostled and uh, really uh, getting attuned to that level of uh, chaos and unpredictability. And then the scenario stuff on the end of that, where you're actually sort of programming yourself to understand like, okay, the, 
in this situation, this is the tactics I'm going to default to. Because if you do that enough in a training situation, that's where your mind's going to go when you encounter something similar in the street. Um, so I think you need all of them. Uh, and I do think, you know, with, with proper safety measures in place, I think you need to go pretty hard with it too. Um, I've seen uh, karate studios, for example, where there are black belts who've never sparred with face contact before. Hmm. Wow. And that that is doing a huge disservice to anyone who's training in martial arts or combatives and who thinks that they're going to be able to handle a street altercation, because no matter how much training or experience you've had, um, in a classroom setting, if you've never been punched in the face and the first time you experience that is out in the street, you're not going to be prepared for it. You know, there's nothing that's going to prepare you for getting rocked like that, except actually experiencing it a few dozen times and, you know, going home with a headache and, you know, a busted nose and, uh, you know, your pride hurt and understanding that when you do take a hard hit, what's going to happen, you know, you're going to feel your motor functions go, you know, you're going to feel everything start to dim. Uh, you're going to have to latch on sort of shape, shake off the cobwebs and get back to work. If you've never been punched in the face before and in a street altercation, someone smacks you in the, in the jaw and you experience that for the first time, you're not going to be prepared and you're just going to get destroyed after that. Um, most likely. Um, and the same is true with, with blade work. If you've never been in that chaotic situation where there's someone in a close quarters, confined area, really trying to stick a training knife into you, um, and you think you're going to be able to sort of duel your way out of that situation, you're, you're going to have a rough time if you ever find yourself in a street altercation. Um, and so that's really the kind of thing that I can keep in mind when I'm training my, my guys. A lot of what you're saying reminds me of, I don't know if you ever heard of Wolf, Wolf's Combatives uh, out of Canada, but uh, he has a very similar former special forces guy, former uh, police officer, and actually one of the last kind of living legacies of the whole Fairburn O'Neill system. He's got a very similar concept when it comes to you need to get hit a lot in training. You need to, you know, those 20 second blitz things uh, really great. And I think that, I mean, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I would expect nothing less from you, to be honest, but. Let me ask you this, uh, live blades in training. What is your opinion about this? Uh, I think they have a place in the organic medium sessions that Ed does, um, where you actually have a dead pig and you're actually sticking it into flesh. Um, cause nothing's going to prepare you for what it like, feels like to put a knife into something or to slash something until you actually do it on organic matter. Um, that was something that we actually started doing when we were doing the black box um, anti-abduction stuff down in Mexico. Uh, and it was illuminating, even for me who came up doing Filipino martial arts, you know, the first time I'd actually stuck a pig, you know, and the pig's already dead and stuff. But first time I ever did that was down in Mexico. And I was surprised at how little resistance there is to flesh and mm -hmm. how much, how catastrophic the wounds can be um, when you're using a blade. And I think it's important for you to have the sensation of doing that so you know what to expect and also to see the type of damage that's actually going to be done with a knife it's going to teach you to respect the blade um and if you do it correctly the last thing you will ever want to do in life it will be to stab or slash something because you'll understand how horrific it really is um i don't teach knife disarming um i i haven't found any knife disarming methodology that I feel comfortable teaching someone and telling them you can realistically disarm a knife with this, especially yeah. in a situation. Um, so in that context, you know, using live blades doesn't really apply to what I do because I don't do that. Um, I, I think target stabbing with live blades is important. Um, you know, you, you have to, you can't be fearing a live blade. You have to be comfortable with a live blade in your hand, but using that against another person in training, I think the risks uh, outweigh the, the uh, benefits from that. Uh, you know, one misplaced thing, you could kill someone in training. Um, whatever benefits you're going to get from training with another person with a live blade, uh, I think is outweighed by, uh, by the risks. That being said, when I was coming up with Filipino martial arts, we, uh, 
we did do some live blade training. I have a Bali song scar here. I've got little nicks and cuts on my hands from machetes. Uh, I actually have one of the times my thumb got sliced with machete. I have that one on film. It was at a demonstration because uh, we were dumbasses back in the nineties. Like uh, I'd never even seen an aluminum training blade when I was coming up to Filipino martial arts. We used the wooden knife. And when we trained uh, Bolo or machete, we actually went to the hardware store and just got machetes. And back then, <laughs> dole out the machete and just put tape over the blade. But, you know, we'd be like, we're not going to be pussies and put fucking tape on the blade. It's fine. <laughs> and so we would literally do machete demonstrations with live machetes. Um, but then again, I was training i had a training partner we trained with each other exclusively in the filipino martial arts it was just the two of us and our instructor so we were very in tune with each other's timing and rhythms and um we we knew the extent of each other's abilities and trusted each other a lot so um we were able to get through it with only a few minor cuts and slices and i only needed stitches one time so only one time um, yeah i, I, I you, much I, of this I, doesn't make me look uh <laughs> look good <laughs> I, I will confess that i stabbed myself i was learning bali song um and they didn't have training bali songs like that we were using i was using a live bali song and i was just getting to the point where i was starting to be able to flow with it i thought i was better than i actually was and i rolled it over my hand and i rolled it back and went to take it with my right hand and i went Funk. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and just gushed blood um don't do that use the training <laughs> If you feel inclined to use Bali songs, I'm not a fan of them personally. Yeah, that was back in the 90s when everything was a little more hardcore. Um, and it's funny <laughs> to say that about the 90s, but yeah, yeah. it's um, I know you said you don't do knife disarms, takeaways, things like that, which is so refreshing to hear because there's guys out there, as you know, Scott, that, you know, this this knife bomb disarm has been pressure tested, all this stuff. Uh, I've always kind of felt similarly that. Like it, it, there's just not much out there, but when it does come to training disarms with a live blade, do you feel that it could actually do the opposite of what's in, intended as far as maybe putting more psychological apprehension after somebody has been cut or had an injury, uh, training with lives, live blades? Um, I think a lot of it depends on the student. Um, there are people who they experience a cut that they'll be like, okay, I I've dealt with that now. You know, um, I've learned that a cut isn't the end of the world. Uh, I think a lot of people, one, would be reluctant to engage in that training, in which case you're not doing the student any good at all because they've just opted out of the training altogether. You've put them off of training that material. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously, if you're using live blades, you're not going to be going, have someone coming at you full force, full power, like you would with a... Um, you know, a flexible training knife where they actually could stick you repeatedly with it. Um, so I, th I think, you know, getting comfortable handling the live blade, if you were inclined to train disarms, doing it in a very measured way could be beneficial, I guess. But, um, and I want to be clear, I'm not against people studying knife disarming or even teaching it as long as it's taught with the um, qualifier that this is a last ditch, no al other alternative you're probably going to die if you're in this situation, but if you can't run away, you can't escape, you can't get away. Here's what you can do. It probably won't work, but this is going to give you at least, you know, a little bit of a chance to, to get the knife away from someone. As long as they're explaining it in that context, I'm fine with it. It's when someone teaches knife disarms and is like, oh yeah, you disarmed this. You just are armed a live blade uh, in class. Someone comes to you with a knife. Uh, I feel sorry for them. Like that's the attitude I really have a problem with. And I've, met a lot of guys like that who I truly believe think that um, they could disarm a knife in a real life alter altercation with minimal effort. Um, and I think they're fucking delusional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of delusion in the martial arts and combatives world these days. Uh, to be polite, I call it optimism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I like to say instructors aren't delusional. I like to say they're highly optimistic about their capabilities or about what they're training. <laughs> that's good. That's, <laughs> that's, I might steal that from you at some point. Um, I'll give you credit though. Mindset when it comes to um, training, what, what, if anything, do you think distinguishes the Libra fighting mindset um, from 
you know, from something else out there? Um, this is something that I've come to learn sort of extends to most combatives. Um, and for a long time, I, str- I, I stayed away from the you describing Libre as combatives early on because I thought that sort of gave the impression that it had military origins mm-hmm. and I would give a mistaken impression of what it was. And I've since come to learn that the industry sort of just thinks of combatives as training for street altercations. And it's very interesting um, that, as you were saying, you know, uh, going back as far as the World War II combative stuff to modern day, most accomplished combatives instructors tend to arrive at the same conclusions as far as, far as the type of training you need to do, the mindset you need to do to use um, pressure testing, all that stuff. And the combatives mindset tends to have a very um, aggressive outlook, which I have strangely found usually isn't a part of knife training. Uh, wasn't when I was coming up to Filipino martial arts, not in a lot of the other knife training I see. It actually tends to have a more passive mindset where it's like, we're going to cut and disable and flow with the opponent and move around them and redirect their energy. Um, and I think part of that is just to help it uh, make it more uh, acceptable. So people don't feel as put off by it. Uh, because when you tell someone like, here's a knife and I want you to stab someone repeatedly with it, it puts them in a very uneasy mindset and it should. And so it's important to contextualize that and make sure the students understand like, look, this isn't meant to be the solution for every self-defense scenario that um, arises or even most of them. This is for the most dire, serious type of situation, armed attacks, sexual assaults, home invasions, uh, military applications, stuff like that. That's what we're training for. And if you find yourself using a knife in a self-defense situation, you're fighting for your life. So it's important to have the mindset of, I'm going to win no matter what I have to do. I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to impose my will on the opponent. I'm going to overwhelm them. And I'm going to take them down as quickly and efficiently as possible. And that's the same mindset that you see in all combatives that I'm aware of. Um, uh, I'm not, I don't teach people, you know, like, oh, we're going to flow with our energy and redirect it and reposition and try and take a more passive approach to it. Um, because personal, and this is just my opinion and people differ. And I always tell people what I say isn't gospel. Don't take what I'm saying is, is, you know, infallible truth. But I, I think the idea that you're going to passively get out of a nice situation doing as little damage as possible and sort of picking an op- opponent apart to the point that they're just going to back down or that they'll just lo- lose motor function is, um, let's call it optimistic. <laughs> um, you know, I think if someone's coming at you with a knife and you're trying to be very, uh, do as little damage as possible to them while they're trying to murder you, you're going to lose. Um, and so you have to have that assertive, aggressive mindset. And you also have to be able to turn it off, which is important. Uh, early on, I kind of learned this and that, you know, we would have very aggressive training sessions. We do blender sessions and my guys would be very, you know, testos- testosterone would be flowing. They'd be amped up and then they'd go home to their families. And like, you know, I would have like wives because our students were mostly male back then telling me like, I'm really glad, you know, my husband found something he loves. I'm glad he's coming here. I don't like the way he is when he comes home. And so I sort of start- had to realize like, after class, I need to give my guys an interval to decompress. So after class, and to this day, I still do it. You know, we'll just kind of hang out and bullshit and talk. And we talk about things other than combatives and other than knife work specifically and violence. You know, about What's going on in our lives? What's going on with our families? You know, you see this movie, what's going on? Um, and just kind of laugh and joke around. And then like, you know, once everyone's kind of decompressed and, in, you know, in a good mindset to go back out into the world, then we kind of leave, you know, it could take five minutes. It could take 15 minutes depending on the class, but um, it's important to be able to um, have that switch where you can turn aggressive and destroy what's in front of you. Um, and then also be able to turn that off and understand the context of that. I don't really like the idea of, um, and it's somewhat prevalent and uh, people tend to adopt a, um, 
survivalist mentality in every part of their life where, you know, they don't feel right going out to get the mail unless they have a weapon on them. And every time they walk into a room, you know, they're constantly like watching everything. It's like, I grew up in a bad neighborhood. So I do things instinctively. Like I always sit with my back to the door. I try and sit between two exits and, you know, anyone who has had dinner with me knows this is how I am. Like, I'm going to sit with my back to a wall. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a look at the people around the room, but then I calm down and I relax. And, you know, it's just when someone walks in, I'll give it a casual glance, but I'm not constantly thinking at any given moment, gunfire is going to break out. Um, I'm not one of those guys who, you know, takes a bunch of gear with me every time I leave my house. I think it kind of puts you in a, um, puts you in the wrong mindset for life because you're just kind of spending your whole life mentally preparing for something that quite honestly, probably will never happen. And someday you're, 80 years old, looking back at your life and realizing, man, I, was, I just lived my life in this sort of paranoid state. And I didn't really get to live my life because I was always, always waiting for a mass shooting or, um, you know, a bomb or whatever it is. And in the post 9-11 world, it's very easy to fall into that mindset because, and for younger people, they don't even appreciate this, I think. But the world changed a lot on 9-11. You know, before then, America kind of thought of terrorism as something that happened somewhere else. We didn't really, you know, we had Columbine before 9-11, but school shootings and mass shootings weren't a big thing. We didn't live with all the stuff that's out there now. So there's generations are growing up in this environment now where violence can break out. You know, horrendous violence can break out at any moment. Um, so it's very easy to get caught up in the idea that, you know, I could, you know, be getting shot at at any given moment here. But statistically, it's still very unlikely that you're going to find yourself in that situation. So it's important to be aware, to be prepared, to know you can handle a situation should it occur, but not that, not let that dictate your life. And I think that's the balance that I, I try to maintain with my guys is be physically, mentally, emotionally capable of absolutely destroying someone in front of you, but don't live your life in that mindset. Be able to switch it on and switch it off. Scott, bro, I'm so glad that you said that. I've interviewed many, many people out there, and I've never heard an instructor say that before, but it really needs to be said. Um, there are so many guys out there who get so caught up, just like you were describing, and um, we all, we're all probably laughing right now, man, because we know it's the truth. And, and, um, and all of us are guilty of it to a certain extent. Right. Like, I, I, I like the toys and stuff. I like looking at, you know, people's EDC carry picks. I don't post them. Um, but it's cool seeing the gear people have, seeing what's out there and stuff like that. But keep it contextualized. A hundred percent, man. It's, I'm glad you said that. Now, I do want to touch on this briefly. Is Especially from watching some of your stuff without context, people might say, like you said before at the initial start of this uh, podcast, man, is it overkill? Is it overkill to go against somebody who's attacking you, you know, and, and cut them and move offline or whatever like that with a knife? Um, contextually, like you put it before, yes, it makes complete sense if you're, you know, a small female, somebody's attempting to murder you, whatever, they have a, a weapon. But could you maybe just clarify this a little bit for us, um, for anybody out there who might be kind of thinking that, hey, is it overkill uh, what we're seeing in these videos here? Um, first of all, I think that's a very fair, um, appraisal, especially if someone isn't, you know, very deep into, uh, what we do and doesn't really understand after seeing it for the first time, I, I can totally appreciate that someone sees that and goes like, wow, what the fuck is that? Um, and I think, uh, especially early on, I wasn't especially, um, I never expected Libre to blow up in the way it did. And so I wasn't really so concerned with presenting things in proper context, mm -hmm. um, I've gotten older because I was also very young when I, I, I started teaching Libre. I was still in my late twenties and now I'm 45 and I, you know, I like to think I'm at least a little bit wiser than I was then. I've sort of learned that it's my responsibility to make sure people understand the context of what they're seeing. Um, when it comes to the overkill, one of the things that I think um, creates um, that sort of impression is I try to stress to my guys that just because you're, you know, going to hit this artery, it doesn't mean you're going to hit that artery. Um, so it's important to have follow-up attacks in mind. I, you know, you might go for the carotid artery and clip the jaw. You might go for a subclavian and it's the collarbone. 
you might go for the lung, but his arm moves and you hit the lung and it might be the femoral that you actually are able to hit. Um, so when you train hitting those in sequence, um, you know, it's with the idea that not all of these target, not all of these are going to hit their mark. And then the other thing is I think people have a mistaken impression of, uh, how fast a lethal knife wound will put someone out of commission. They think that it's like the movies, you hit the neck and the guy just falls over dead and it's done, which the reality is far more gruesome than that. And this is something that I always try and, um, preempt by saying like, I know this sounds disturbing and I'm not trying to, um, glorify the violence or sort of revel in how gory it is. It's important to understand what's actually going to happen when you create an, like say you slash someone's neck or stab them in the neck. There's going to be aerial spray. It's going to be very bloody. You're going to be covered in blood. It's going to be nasty. And the guy isn't just going to fall over dead. There's going to be an interval between the time you have and the time he actually starts to lose consciousness where he's still really a threat. And the way you bring them down faster and get them to and eliminate that threat is you try to hit multiple targets so that they'll actually lose consciousness faster. And there's a lot of um, variables that are going to go into how fast hitting a lethal target is going to let someone expire. Uh, you know, how cleanly you hit it. If you sever an artery completely, if you just nick it, uh, medications they might be on, uh, their overall health, how fast their heart is beating, all that or is going to create variables. So it's important to understand that if you're trying to put someone down, it's not about, you know, delivering these multiple stabs isn't about just being brutal for the sake of being brutal. It's about making sure the threat is eliminated as quickly as possible and understanding that just because you've tried to hit lethal targets when you're training, you have to be conditioned to press your attack further until the threat is eliminated. Um, because if you do nick an artery, say, and now the guy's bleeding profusely, now he's enraged. And if you've hit that artery and backed off to wait, there's nothing to keep him in that direct, in that interval between you hitting that target and him losing consciousness from jumping on you and just murdering you. Mm -hmm. So it's important, even as the person is bleeding out, to be able to, if you can't remove yourself from the situation, to keep them on the defensive until they're down and they're no longer a threat. And I know that's unpleasant to think about, uh, and it should be. If, unless you're a psychopath, you should recoil at the idea of having to take another person's life, especially uh, something as gruesome as uh, with a knife. But if you do find yourself in that situation, you need to be prepared to do it correctly and do it efficiently. And um, maybe this is just my own personality quirk because I haven't heard a lot of other instructors say this. Um, or maybe they feel this way and just don't express it. But I think especially with something like blade work, where if you're using it, it is a life and death uh, situation. If you're teaching things that aren't effective, you're putting people's lives at risk. They're trusting you to tr teach them how to do something effectively and efficiently and to become proficient at, at it. And if you are giving them the illusion of proficiency, if you're making them think that they can handle a situation and they can't, and that person dies because they had that delusion, that's on you to a certain extent. Um, I try not to give my guys a false sense of security. I try to make them capable and let them know they're capable. And then at the same time, make them understand that you should never, ever, ever want to do this. Uh, one of the things I like to do after blender sessions, especially with newer students, is they do the blender session. It's close quarters, you know, it's confined space. You know, they come out and, you know, the testosterone is flowing and it's exciting and energetic. And um, for certain people, you know, having that level of aggression is fun. It's like boxing, you know, it's like you get in there and you get battered up. And, you know, it's like, uh, I, I hate to say fun, but, you know, there, there's definitely, you know, you come out of that feeling um, empowered to a certain extent. And one of the things I like to do is I'll say, okay, now I want to think about everywhere in that session, you slash, you were slashed or you were cut or stabbed and everywhere you cut or slashed uh, or stabbed someone else. And I said, get in your head. And then I'll start showing them pictures of actual knife wounds. I'd be mm -hmm. like, this is what it would actually look like if you went through that. This is what, you know, this is what it would look like if your intestines were spilled. This is what, and again, I know this sounds graphic, but it's important to contextualize this. This is what you did to him when you stabbed him in the neck. And then you see them like start to turn a little bit green and realize like, oh, fuck, like th this really isn't, shouldn't be fun. It really shouldn't be something that, you know, I, I think about and smile. And um, 
I've lost students at that point as well. And they're like, no, I just, I, I don't, I, I can't let myself go here. And I totally understand and respect that. Um, and I also think that is uh, where the non-lethal knife work that a lot of guys uh, do comes into play. If you know deep down inside that no matter what the situation is, I just am morally uh, incapable of taking another human's life. I just don't think I could do that where people can train, you know, should gravitate towards the non-lethal knife work where they can, you know, start to study ways to maybe disable someone with a knife, even though I find it to be, um, you know, less efficient. Um, I think that's where the uh, audience for that type of work is. So I think there's a place for it, but it's not what I do. Interesting. You know, I keep thinking about this, uh, this movie, and I'm sure you get this all the time, but the hunted with, um, Antonio Banderas or whatever. And as a guy who's trained special forces guys, as a guy who's trained these high level uh, elite units, how accurate would that movie be uh, as far as, you know, not only the, uh, the training aspect of it, but also the aftermath of what has happened in close combat. Um, it's a movie, you know, uh, you know, it's like, and I believe the choreographers, uh, I, I know one of the guys who actually worked on the movie. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, you know, and, you know, they were very, you know, very open about the fact, like, you know, they had to stretch out the fight scenes and make them, you know, longer for this because real knife violence happens very quickly. Um, and, you know, obviously some of the wounds sustained, you know, especially in the final knife fight would just, you know, you know, everyone would, just, I mean, they wouldn't be just walking away from that and going back to, I think it was Alaska. There would, there would be a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of, uh, recuperation time a lot of you know time in the hospital and stuff like that but i mean that who wants to end a movie like that where it's like okay yeah. the final fight over now we're going to do another hour of this guy's surgeries and stitch it back <laughs> together um you know i think what that movie did really well is to show how bloody and awful you know an actual bladed knife fight would be with two guys who know what they're doing and how horrific it would be um you know it, it's hard for me to say you know uh you know, as far as like, uh, the training that they were doing in there, you know, there's only a couple quick clips of it. And I think there's a central removal technique, if I remember correctly. And that's something that I, I teach military guys as well. Um, I think it was presented very well. I, I mean, I've never taught someone out in the woods like that before. <laughs> um, but they were also supposed to be teaching these guys tracking and I don't, that's not to say it doesn't happen. It's just something I've never done. And it's kind of hard for me to speculate because I can only talk about the things that, you know, I've done. Um, like for me, when I was going down and working with Ed's guys, we were training at a, a hangar at the Tijuana airport. Um, and in that context, these guys um, didn't have training guns. Like uh, we made them train in full gear because that's what they would be fighting. in. And literally these guys just, you know, took the magazines out, cleared the weapons, and they had real <laughs> firearms on them the whole time. Um uh, and I even asked him, I'm like, when you guys are doing this, have you ever just had a round accidentally goes off? He's like, yeah, it happens sometimes. So <laughs> be aware of where, of where the weapons are pointed. So it's like the whole time you're kind of like weaving in and out. And so, you know, for you know, something like that, it was a very different experience for me. Um, but I think overall, it gives a very good impression of, of what knife work should, how, you know, how it's not as... Um, it, it lets you know the knife work isn't going to be pretty. It's going to be violent. It's going to be bloody and it's going to be messy. And I think that uh, in that sense, they actually did a really good job of, of giving people a realistic, a more realistic view of what knife violence should be. Plus it's just a great movie. I love it. Classic. I mean, you can't talk about knife fighting and knife stuff without, without mentioning that movie. I think all of us uh, in the martial arts community, that's kind of one of those cult classics. Now, I don't want to take up too, too much more of your time, man, but um, I do have one more question that this is kind of the age old thing right now in, in combatives. So combatives versus MMA. I get this question a lot. I know I talk about it a lot. Can you, can you give us any guidance on kind of what your thoughts here about that whole jujitsu, MMA, Muay Thai versus, you know, the combatives or what we would describe as, as, you know, reality self-defense, um, what are your what are your thoughts and opinions there, if any? Um, so I think one of the things I see combatives guys say um, is they'll tell say like you know MMA doesn't prepare you for the street, 
And, you know, these guys don't know what a street altercation is really about. And I, I think the vast majority of even semi-skilled MMA guys will absolutely destroy someone in a street fight. Yeah. Um, but I think there are also elements of street violence that MMA obviously doesn't prepare you for. There was that story a, a year or two ago where uh, an, a very well-known, I don't remember the details exactly, but a very well-known MMA fighter, a very accomplished guy. He might've even uh, had a title. Uh, there was a home invasion where a crackhead broke into his house and he ended up having to fight with the guy. And, uh, you know, he said it was the hardest fight of his life. Hmm. It was, you know, it was just a wiry crackhead who just was fighting, you know, fighting like hell. Um, so the dynamics are different uh, and it depends on what kind of situation you're training for. It's like if your main concern is a, you know, getting in a barroom brawl or a, a parking lot altercation over a um, parking space, which I don't think either someone should willingly be participating in. Um, but if that's where your mind is at, as far as your training, I think MMA will, you know, prepare you pretty well for, um, you know, actually very well to handle a one-on-one -on -one street altercation and fuck someone up. And I think it's unrealistic for some combative instructors to say like, these guys can't handle themselves like in a real life street fight. I think they absolutely can. Uh, but when it comes to things like multiple attackers, weapons, things like that, I think if you do want to use MMA as your base for fighting skills, I think you should augment it with some combatives training. If that's where your mindset is at, you need to do some multiple opponent work. You need to, uh, you know, do learn some soft skills, pre-attack cues, situational control, things like learning exits, looking, uh, knowing how to look at someone and tell if they're dangerous, looking for, um, you know, the cauliflower ears, broken noses, scar tissue around the eyes, boxers fractures are a big one that I think gets overlooked, like for a recessed knuckle in the hand. Um, all those things are all things that can tell you, like if this guy, um, has experience in the street, uh, being aware of multiple attackers, uh, no, being familiar with prison ink, uh, local gangs where you are, things like that. I think, you know, if you're training with uh, self-defense in mind and you're training MMA as your base, you do need to at least get out to some combative seminars and uh, bridge those skills a little bit. Um, and also sparring as we were saying earlier is different than fighting and competitive fighting is different than street fighting and you know whether it's box I, i'm not an mma guy myself i'm a boxing fan um and either one of those whether it's boxing or mma there's a period at the start of the fight where you're sort of you know feeling each other out getting used to the range finding your opponent's rhythm and then trying to get through street fights usually don't happen like that you know usually someone comes in swinging for the fences um and it's uh it's less tact, you know, there, there's less nuance and less tactical uh, tactics being employed and it's more moving on instinct. Um, and so I think if an MMA guy is training with the idea of training for the street, they need to understand the differences between fighting in a cage and fighting on the street. But again, that being said, I think the vast majority of skilled MMA guys can handle most street situations with very, with, without problems. It's, mostly being aware of weapons, aware of multiple attackers, learning how to stack opponents. Um, if they're so inclined, getting some weapons work in, not necessarily a knife, but, you know, at least being able to use a blunt instrument, um, improvised weapon in case a situation escalates. Uh, fighting in low light is something that I think it's neglected a lot. You know, it's like, uh, if you look at street assaults, most, you know, uh, I don't, most knife attacks happen after dark and a lot of fights do as well. If you've never sparred or trained in low light it's going to be a game changer uh when you realize that you can't see the punches coming the way you thought you could uh and you have to be able to attach to the opponent and feel where they are because you can't see clearly um things like that i think would be beneficial for an mma fighter to cross train in uh on the flip side i think that every combatives practitioner should get some boxing experience in at the very least um, grappling skills as well, but I think boxing will, uh, help you develop things that, um, get overlooked in the Eastern martial arts a lot, you know, things like range, timing, um, accuracy, rhythms, um, positioning and boxing will give you a very good bullshit filter as well when it comes to striking arts. Uh, cause if you've boxed for a couple of years and have some sparring experience, you'll 
look at you know something right away and be like no that's not gonna work um so you know i i think that people who train in combatives would be uh well served to train in boxing and uh get some grappling experience in as well and maybe you know get some sport work in as well i i I have a big problem with the idea that people tend to lock into what they do and think it's right and what everyone else is doing is wrong or what anyone else does has no benefit to what they're doing. Um, it's a very limiting mindset. And I think people tell themselves that um, just because they don't want to do it. You know, it's like, I cannot believe me. I can understand people not wanting to box, especially if they're like in an old school boxing gym where they're going to get banged up and you're going to, you know, you're going to be leaving with a headache and like anyone who's boxed knows that feeling after you've been hit hard the next day and your neck and your back and your upper back are just fucking fucked because you, your head got whipped back and like it hurts to like t- twist your head at all and shit like that. So I understand people not wanting to do that. It's not something that I think anyone looks forward to in boxing, but I think people tell themselves they don't need that because they don't want to experience it. Um, and I think if they're honest with themselves, they would realize no, I probably should do this. I just don't want to do it. Well said. Wow. Last question I have for you about combatives um, directly is you mentioned about guys getting trapped into that mindset of my system is the best, this and that. And, you know, I think this is a big thing in jujitsu. Can you, do you want to touch on wrestling, grappling? Um, how really important is this stuff for real life street altercations? Because we hear a lot of, you know, from the Brazilian guys about, oh, it's, so it's the most important thing to study. Um, you're a man who, who has a lot of real life um, analysis and experience on this. Uh, what would you say to something like that? Um, just as with, you know, what we discussed with MMA, I think most accomplished Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys in a street fight will handle themselves just fine. Um, you know, the average altercation, a drunk swinging on them, uh, you know, the, you know, a, you know, j- ex-boyfriend uh, you know a psychopathic neighbor who who takes a crack at them i think most brazilian jiu-jitsu guys will take the guy to the ground and absolutely destroy them um but uh you know there used to be a saying in brazilian jiu-jitsu that you know i i think the gracies initially said it like 97 percent of fights end on the ground or something like that uh 100 of fight almost 100 of fights start standing up so I think it's important to at least have some basic striking skills as well. Um, uh, my, my weakness is I am not an accomplished grappler by any stretch. And that's why I don't teach grappling. And I tell people, you know, I could do some private training, you know, get some private lessons in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I actually have some uh, people who have Naga belts in, in the uh, Libre Association. Uh, you know, and I could get some videos and I can half-ass put something together that would fool 90% of people into thinking I knew what I was doing and build some knife work into that. But I don't teach anything that I don't feel I'm an expert in. And I am not by any stretch of the imagination an expert in grappling. I'm not even an accomplished novice in it. It's, it's my weakest area. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to answer this, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for people who do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because I do think, because they actually prove that they can do it every, you know, they get in there and roll and actually get that experience. Uh, but I think at the same time, they would be well served to learn some basic striking. I mean, even if they just did a year of boxing, just to augment, uh, just to augment the grappling and just to give them a different set of skills and understand how a striker thinks, I think would be beneficial, even if their mindset isn't towards applying that themselves. Um, you know, the, the flip side of this is we only have so many hours in the day. Uh, you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, and if you want to do things well, you have to pick what you're going to focus on. If you try and train across the board and striking, grappling, knife work, stick work, firearms, um, uh, medical applications like yes in a perfect world you should you know we would all be 100 percent of our capabilities and all this but we all have jobs and families and responsibilities and you kind of have to pick what you're going to be proficient in and sort of focus on that without neglecting everything else i think really like what you're saying about the boxing i couldn't agree more with you i, I think that that's one of the most overlooked yet most important things 
when it comes to actual street fighting martial arts is, you know, like you're saying, learn how to get hit, learn how to take a hit, learn how to give a hit, learn about the angles, all of that stuff. It's um, and, and really great. Grew up around a lot of street fights, you know, you know that a lot of fights, probably half of them are one punch. Yeah. Two out with each other and then one clocks the other one and that dude goes down. He might not get knocked out, but, you know, he gets rocked and people break it up and that's it. You know, um, so, you know, it's like, I, I think it's important to know what a punch looks like coming at you and being able to slip it or block it. Um, so just for the defensive aspects alone, I think boxing is beneficial. Your book, um, Rough Edges, a literary fuck you. So <laughs> this, <laughs> love, the, love the fucking title, man. Like best title I've ever heard, to be honest. Um, how did this book come about? And how was it different than Finding Libre? Um, honestly, I think that I'm kind of getting to be a cranky old man now and like all cranky and I want to bitch about stuff that irritates me. Uh, and I just had a form where I could write a book about it. And, you know, it's a lot of the book is just shit that pisses me off, shit from my personal past, that pisses me off, shit I see in society. Um, and uh, that that's, you know... Finding Libre was an autobiography. It chronicles my life about growing up, uh, how I got into martial arts, you know, my family growing up, uh, just the environment that sort of fueled me to pursue martial arts. Um, there are some uh, autobiographical elements to uh, this new book. There are some chapters that talk about, you know, my relationships with some of my uh, previous instructors and things like that. But, um, you know, it, it's... It was very much inspired by one of Anthony Bourdain's lesser known books, uh, Medium Raw, mm -hmm. where he just wrote a bunch of essentially essays on things relating to, um, to the culinary world. Uh, and that's a broad range of topics. And I was sort of inspired by that idea of just being able to write different essays on things that intrigue me or express my opinion on different things without having to have a overarching narrative, like a beginning, middle and end to it. And so the book's divided into three sections. There's the first section is about culture, about what it was like, you know, sort of coming of age in the 90s, um, the mindset that we had in the 90s, how that differs from the way millennials think now, sort of comparing and contrasting those sorts of things. Um, things about like having the proper attitude about how to deal with adversity and things like that. Just things I've learned from experience. And then there's a section that's on martial arts. Um, I discuss the differences in culture between traditional martial arts and combatives, uh, which there is a radical difference between just the cultures of the two. Uh, I talk about how much it drives me nuts that people love to, to rip on Bruce Lee now. I wrote a whole chapter about it. Um, I talk about, you know, what's trendy to talk about now, uh, the Chi masters and, you know, all this, these bullshit, you know, guys like Chi blasting each other and energy fighting. I wrote a chapter about that and I sort of discussed the psychology behind why people think they can do this and why people think it works on them. Uh, and then I wrote a chat. I wrote a whole section about just my personal mentors and where some of them fucked up and real, where some of them really um, helped mold me into who I am today and the importance of having, having solid mentors and knowing who to, who to uh, take things from and who not to. Uh, and so, uh, you know, but really it's mostly just, <laughs> just, uh, a book of me ranting about shit that pisses me off. <laughs> Man, I'd, uh, I'd really like to read that, to be honest. I, I think I'm going to probably have to get my hands because you, you and I, before we went live, you, we were talking a little bit about what was it like growing up in the nineties versus today. And, um, you know, I, we won't get into that too much, but suffice to say, there was a few differences that we picked out. So, um, here in an old head like you yeah. talking to an old head like me, it's uh, it, yeah, it's it's a funny thing for sure. First um, chapter is is about that, about growing up in the '90s, that sort of being the slacker generation, you know, because yeah, uh, yeah. is like I I think people forget, you know, people my age, I'm 45, you know, I I was a teenager in the '90s. We were called the slacker generation, like uh, technically we're, we're Gen X, but People they didn't call us back that, that back then. We were the slacker generation. And you saw it in our movies, the old Kevin Smith movies and uh, all the movies about two guys just hanging out and trying to sort out life and how my generation's mindset sort of changed after 9-11. Um, 
and how we kind of sort of had to step up and we finally found a purpose and uh, how future generations, the post 9-11 generations have all sort of been coddled to the point yeah. of uh, being ineffective at life uh, and why that is. And one of the things I point out in the book, um, just so it doesn't feel like I'm totally bagging on millennials, is millennials actually should be the toughest generation. Um, because think of the world they grew up in. They grew up in post 9-11 with terrorism and school shootings and uh, mass shootings and all this horrific shit that I didn't have to grow up with. Uh, the difference is every generation before the millennial generation, their parents told them, look, the world's a hard place. You need to toughen the fuck up to deal with it. And the millennials were raised with the mindset of the world is a fucked up place and it's getting more dangerous. We need to protect you from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, that's kind of where, why the millennial generation sort of has this reputation for being anxiety ridden and, uh, being oversensitive and uh, not being able to effectively deal with any level of adversity is because they were raised with that mindset that like, you know, it's tough. You, we need to protect you from it instead of like, you know, Hey, tough the fuck up. Shit's not going to be easy. And I think, you know, the solution to getting, cause I, I don't think there's many people in the world who think the world is heading in the right direction at the moment um, and not to get political on any level, but just society in general seems there's a lot of tension in the world and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people not being able to deal with people who don't agree with them or yeah. not being able to deal with them. And I think it's because people aren't being toughened up as kids anymore. And, you know, uh, a friend of mine who I quote in the book, Robert Anderson, he says, um, it's one of the wisest things I've ever heard anyone say is there are two experiences a boy needs to have in life. Uh, getting punched in the face and punching someone in the face. <laughs> getting punched in the face teaches you you're not made of glass. Teaches you, yeah, you know what? You can take an ass kicking. It's okay. You can get back up. You know, wipe the dust off, get back in there. And then knowing that you have the physical and emotional capability of dropping someone who steps out of the line. Both of those things make for a well-rounded person or at least a well-rounded young boy. And I think now the idea that, you know, if a, if a boy gets in a fight, it's like, you know, a whole big thing where they might be expelled from school and shit like that. I don't think you're doing, doing them any, you're not doing them a service and telling them and forbidding them those experiences, basically. I no, know that's not doing really them big they, disservice. Yeah. 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 You know, I, you know, I, 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 I can't speak for how, you know, what the experience of being a young woman is like or being a girl growing up. But, you know, for a young man, I think young men need to be roughed up. They need to take a beating every now and then. They need to have those experiences and they need to experience consequences for their action. You know, you run your mouth off to the wrong guy when you're in grade school and he fucking cracks you in the jaw. It's a good life lesson. You yeah. know, hey, man, my mouth off to. Um, and you know, that's obviously something you don't see anymore because people run them, their mouths at people online all the fucking time now. And, uh, cause they didn't learn in school. Like, no, someone might get pissed off and break your fucking jaw over that shit. <laughs> well, that's another thing too, is kids are used to texting. Kids are used to the chat uh, forms and, you know, this and that comments on YouTube and they can just run their mouth like an asshole and yeah. no one will ever know who they are, but didn't use yeah. to be like that. And, you know, it's like, I don't know what the, what, you know, the experience of being school age now is, but I, I t tend to think that shit that's online tends to stay on online. And when they're in school, like, you know, the cyber bullying, you know, doesn't lead to, you know, the kid who's being cyber bullied, walking up to you and punching you in the fucking head right. <laughs> lead to that. The cyber bullied kid, you know, after 10 years of being tormented, brings a gun to school and shoots everyone. Yeah. Um, because, you know they I probably shouldn't say this, but because they didn't have the outlet of just being able to like, Hey, this guy's talking shit, fucking punch him in the mouth. We get in a fight. And I think a lot of people also don't realize those fights you have as a kid usually end up becoming really good friends with the kid you fought with. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, because kids don't fight, you know, don't, and I'm not saying kids should live violent lives. I'm just saying that, you know, they're coming of age experiences, learning to shave, getting in a fight, you know, getting your ass kicked, kicking someone's ass. These are things that boys should experience. Um, and I think the idea of like, you know, someone stepping out of line with you as a kid and, you know, scrapping with that kid and, you know, earning some respect 
it's good for you. You know, it, it, you know, it puts it, you know, it makes you more of a man. And if you're denied that, eventually you lose your shit and shoot up. Not everyone, but you know, there's a risk you're going to lose your shit and shoot up a school. Um, I think that's part of the problem. I'm, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I could be wrong. That's just my impression. <laughs> No, I, you know, I think you're so on point with that. And, um, you know, to leave it kind of with this final thought is we don't we don't have that ability these days to solve our problems like that. So for a young man to be able to go to a class like you guys hold and actually get some licks, give some licks. I mean, in absence of being able to actually punch that bully in the face, I think it's such a valuable thing for young men to go through. Yeah. And if they don't, you know, if they're growing up in a society where, you know, where you're going to get expelled if you get in a fight at school, let the kid box. Yeah. Let him get in the ring. At least then he has some kind of outlet, you know, it's like he's still developing, you know, he's not sort of dealing with the uh, social hierarchy aspect of that and learning. Uh, one of the lines that I have in the book actually is a kid losing a street fight. gets the only participation trophy that ever really matters. <laughs> um, it's the respect of his peers because he stood up for himself. And if you've got his ass kicked, he might get taunted about it a little bit, but everyone's going to be like, Hey, you know what? He stood up, you know, he fought the kid. Good for him. Um, and if a kid's going to be denied that experience in life, you know, I think, I think a young man boxing can sort of at least grab some kind of that, uh, some element of that and bring it into his, his life. Yeah. I, it's so true, man. I think we do need a little bit more stoicism, in the world today, specifically in our, you know, Western society. So, but man, Scott, it's been such a fucking pleasure talking to you, man. I really appreciate you coming on. So thank you so much. Went by quick this time. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it actually, and I feel like we could keep going for another hour or two, but, um, you know, maybe at some point we'll be able to get you back on, um, you know, to your schedule permitting. I know you're a busy guy, but I'm down, man. Just let me awesome. know in. Awesome. Well, stand by for me. I want to run a couple of things by you after we uh, get off the line here. But um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for stopping by and checking out another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. Until next time. Oh, and I almost forgot. Guys, Scott's links are all going to be down below in the description here. You can follow him on Instagram, on YouTube, at Libra Fighting. You can also check out his website. I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, LibraFighting.com. Uh, dot bigcartel.com if I'm correct Libre. about that. Say that again. I, we lost connection Libre, real quick. Libre fighting works too. Libre fighting. Perfect. Or just type it into Google. Uh, easier thing probably to do. So guys, until next time, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense and I will see you in the next Tactical Podcast.